रिस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर आनंद कुमार जी प्रोफेसर जैन तोमर जी एंड प्रोफेसर संतोष किशन नारायण खेडकर जी इट इज इंडीड अ ग्रेट ऑनर फॉर मी टू बी इन्वाइटेड टू स्पीक ऑन दिस टॉपिक and really i was pushed to do this by professor anand kumar ji because as you can very well realize uh, there are two aspects to this particular proposition and i must also say dear colleagues and friends first of all what is the idea of india Uh, can there be an idea of india certainly what i am going to talk about is what i consider could be the idea of india or an idea of india that i think could be the idea of india so we will first try to develop this and beyond this then we can talk about respect uh dear friends uh professor anand kumar has already mentioned to you that uh i will invoke swami vivekanand but before invoking swami vivekanand i must mention to you that we must talk about his guru sri ramakrishna because a lot of people know about swami vivekanand but uh, apart from those who are spiritually committed and dedicated uh, they may not have pursued sri ramakrishna even though they know about him i am very delighted that the names of rabindranath tagore and mohandas gandhi have been drawn out Uh, i will not talk much about rabindranath tagore apart from saying that he was deeply respectful of sri ramakrishna sri ramakrishna was swami vivekananda's guru and then we will talk about swami vivekananda because then we will be able to understand swami vivekananda better and from there i will say a few things about mohandas gandhi and this is also a less researched area what was the impact of swami vivekanand on gandhi ji uh this is a story that is probably only known to very few people they are not scholars they have not published books but famously did mohandas gandhi say that i have read his complete works and after having read his complete works the love that i had for my country became a thousand fold i must also tell you why i want to focus on swami vivekanand i want to focus on swami vivekanand because netaji subhash chandra bose was almost like a disciple of swami vivekanand he was he was almost inspired motivated and run by the spirit of swami vivekananda very few of you would know that there are not only pages in the discovery of india dedicated to swami vivekananda but that jawaharlal nehru also was deeply inspired by swami vivekananda i actually happened to read a speech that he delivered when the ramakrishna mission was set up in delhi so what you must understand is that this generation is not living with the cultural capital of that generation you know during the during that time it was very common to say oh swami ji was a great man he was a hero today it is more common place to say that oh he is a hindu nationalist 
But what kind of a hero is he? <laughs> Very few care to think about. And that is why I want to invoke Sri Ramakrishna before I come to Swami Vivekananda. As you can see, the Holy Trinity is sitting in front of you. Sri Ramakrishna came at a time when India had been politically subjugated. And when political subjugation happens, many kinds of subjugations happen because the colonized begin to think that the colonizer is superior. And that was a time when most of the Bengali elite was converting to Christianity. Others thought that idol worship was an inferior form, that all these rituals are backward practices. So on the one hand, there was Christianity. On the other hand, there was the Brahmo Samaj. And around this time, there came a man called Sri Ramakrishna who was almost unlettered. He was brought up in a remote village in a pious family with a spiritual bent and inclination. And family circumstances led him to become the priest of the Kali temple in Dakshineshwar. If you ever have the time, please go and visit the Kali temple in Dakshineshwar because it is a historic place. You know, Sri Ramakrishna worshipped there. Swami Vivekanand went and prayed to Mother Kali over there. So even if you have faith, if you believe that you are a Hindu, you should visit the Kali temple in Dakshineshwar, not just the Kali temple in Kaligat uh, in Calcutta. Now, in this Kali temple in Dakshineshwar, Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual practices led him to a curiosity that if God exists, then she must be seen. So he did intense and many types of penance. And when the mother did not appear before him, at one point he, she, he took a sword and said that, if you don't appear before me, I will just take my life. And that is when the mother appeared. And ever since, he believed that mother never left him. So he lost all his ego. He never thought that he was doing great things like the big gurus think of today. He always thought that it was mother who was doing it for him. So the first and important fact about Sri Ramakrishna is that he did not believe in anything until he had a spiritual experience. The second important thing to note about Sri Ramakrishna is that his spiritual experience did not end with Mother Kali. There came along a man from Punjab called Totapuri. He became a disciple of Totapuri. And Totapuri said that you have to understand God in undifferentiated form. So he put Sri Ramakrishna inside a hut. It took him a couple of hours to take his mind away from God as a person. But within three or four days, it, see, it is said that he saw the light. And his guru said that what took me 40 years to achieve, you have done in three days. But then, you know, his curiosity did not stop there. There came along a lady who became his guru, Bhairavi Devi. And through very controversial tantra sadhana, which he did not recommend for many of his devotees, he found that you can see light even through tantra sadhana. And after having carried out all of these sadhanas, he lived like a Christian. He just became a Christian, lived like a Christian, and he saw the light. And then he followed the precepts of Sufi Islam And he said that in Bangla, he said, Joto mot, Toto pot. Now, why do I say that this must be central to the idea of India? Joto mot, Jitne mat hai, Utne pat hai. As many are the ways, so many, uh, as many are the paths, so many are the ways. 
If you go back to ancient times and think about ekam sat, vipra bahuda vadanti, truth, sat is one, sages call it by many names. This is, <laughs> this is not something new. But perhaps a spiritual figure, an incarnation of this day and age, had to live this life and proclaim it to the world that, you know, Muslims are not evil people because they follow Islam or that Christians because they follow Jesus Christ are lesser or that if you are a bhakta, then you are lesser than a jnani. You know, a lot of Vedantic scholars think that those who believe that God is one and that God is in everything are superior to those who believe that you can worship the image of Kali in the temple. In fact, have, after having had these experiences, Sri Ramakrishna said something that probably even the greatest Acharyas in history have not said. He said, Kali and Brahman are the same. You know, this is actually more radical than saying that Islam and Hinduism both lead to truth because there are as many differences among the Jnanis and the Bhaktas as there are, there could be among Hindus and Muslims. He said Kali and Brahman are the same and the way to understand it is that Brahman is the fire but its power to burn is manifested in Kali. So there is a difference between God which exists and the God which emanates power through what some people called Maya. Now, I <laughs> don't want to give a lecture on spirituality because as you can see, I'm not a deeply spiritual person. But we must understand that somebody who had realized all this could say this. Now, why should we believe this? Vivekanand was an agnostic, a Brahmo, who was going pillar to post trying to find out one person who will say that I have seen God. So he went to Devendranath Tagore, he went to all the intellectuals, he was born in a fairly well-to-do middle class family and not one of them could give him a convincing answer. This was the time when in Scottish Church College in Calcutta, his English literature teacher said, that there was a certain experience that had been experienced by the poet Yeats. So Vivekanand said, can you tell me somebody in human form who can realize this experience? And this teacher of his in Scottish Church College told him that please go to this Kali temple in Dakshineshwar. There is an old man called Ramakrishna. He has realized this state. That is how Vivekananda landed at the lap of his master, Sri Ramakrishna, and bluntly asked him, have you seen God? <laughs> and astonishingly, this man says, not only have I seen God, but I see him more clearly than I can see you. Now, this really perplexed Vivekananda because as Professor Anand Kumar said, he had a very agnostic scientific bent of mind and like his guru, he would not accept anything. So he tested his guru in many ways. In fact, in one instance, it, say, it is said that Sri Ramakrishna gave him the experience of Nirvana. And at that stage, he was scared of being in that state. He said, okay, you don't believe me? Let me try to show you that there is no difference between you and everything else in the world. And as the world was dissolving in front of him, he was... He said, look, I have a family, I have... <laughs> then Vivekanand used to think, you know, this is a very peculiar person. He says that I cannot touch any metal, I cannot touch any piece of wealth. So one day he put a coin underneath his bed. And, you know, Sri Ramakrishna just jumped. He said, who has put this piece of metal? 
So then, you know, in a number of ways, Swami Vivekananda tested Sri Ramakrishna that, you know, you can tell me that I am fake because there are many things I am saying I cannot show you. But Sri Ramakrishna could. And obviously, his disciple was not Rahul Mukherjee, it was Swami Vivekananda. So he could, I mean, if Sri Ramakrishna told me that I will experience Nirvana, probably won't happen. But, you know, when a Vivekananda meets Sri Ramakrishna, the experience between the two can be very different. So you have to understand this context. This is a very Indian context. This is a very experienced context. And this is a very non-sectarian and very transcendental context. Because Sri Ramakrishna would have seen the light in Kali, he would have seen light in Islam, he would have seen light in Christianity, he would have seen light as an Advaitvadin, he would have seen light as a Tantric Yogi. Now, the last paradox, the climax of the story is the following. So, Sri Ramakrishna has cancer, then he is in control of himself, he knows that he will give up his life. And at that time, Swami Vivekananda's name was Narendranath Datta. Narendranath Datta or Naren asked this question. That now, Guruji, can I go to the Himalayas and do my tapasya and become liberated? And Sri Ramakrishna got very angry. He said, what are you talking about? I have spent so much energy on you just so that you get liberated. You have to liberate the world with you. You have to uplift the poor. You have to serve God in man. And that was another jolt for, for Narendranath Datta who became Swami Vivekananda. So you have to understand this context before you understand what Swami Vivekananda is and what he did. Now this Vivekananda, after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, they were almost bankrupted because they took vows of austerity, they had no money. There was one devotee of Sri Ramakrishna who rented a big house which was considered to be haunted. People were afraid of ghosts. So they rented this house and the 11 or 12 disciples, the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna lived and did austerity. After doing austerity and living there and doing a lot of tapasya, Swami Vivekanand, as Professor Anand Kumar has said, with nothing apart from either the imitation of Christ or the Gita in his hand, traversed the length and breadth of India by that time, he had a lot of experience, but not the amount of experience that Professor Anand Kumar just talked about, which would happen after he had ended all his journeys. In the United States, he went to the Colombian expo Exposition in Chicago, from where he became a historic figure. So it is this Vivekananda who is after his going to the United States is the person that we understand as Vivekananda. Now, my view is that Swami Vivekananda is better represented in an undiluted form, you know, because <laughs> I can never equal the, uh, the energy, the vibrancy, and the truth that is hidden in the words that he uttered. So what I will do for you is, I will read out some passages. First, I told you something about Sri Ramakrishna's life, right? And now I will read out some passages from various lectures, many of which he delivered in the United States, to give you some understanding of what he thought religion was and what he thought was the role of various religions in the service of humanity. So let us pick up a few uh, short snippets.
So in one place, Vivekananda says, if you go below the surface, you will find that unity between man and man, between races and races, high and low, rich and poor, gods and men, and men and animals. If you go deep enough, all will be seen as only variations of the one. And he who has attained this conception of oneness has no more delusion. What can delude him? He knows the reality of everything, the secret of everything. Where is there any more misery for him? He has traced the reality of everything to the Lord, the center, the unity of everything, and that is eternal existence, eternal knowledge, eternal bliss. Now let me just say that this is a Vedantic conception. If you are a Vedantist, and there is a lot of very serious philosophical uh, exposition on this, Vivekananda himself is considered to be a philosopher of uh, some significance, not reputation. Not only did Harvard and Columbia both invite him for professorships, but many learned Indian scholars think that he is a landmark figure after Shankaracharya. And when he's talking about unity, what he's basically saying is that what is inside of you, me, man, dog, Muslim, Christian, everyone has the same basic substance. And if you believe in Advaita Vedanta, you cannot believe in fanaticism. I don't want to belabor the philosophical aspects because it will become boring, but the simple fact is, uh, is actually quite revealing. Then he says, if one religion is true, then by the same logic, all other religions are also true. This is authenticated by the fact that holiness, purity and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. So this is a different kind of an argument he's making. First he's making the argument that if you believe in, in Vedanta, which is the Upanishads, which is the latest part of the Vedas, not the ritual part, then of course you should have no confusion. But there is one more reason why you should think like this. Because every religion has produced this. I can tell you the story of Kabir Das, for example. You know, there was a saint called Ramanandacharya who was a great, I think, Vishisht Advaitvadin. And Kabir Das wanted to become his disciple. So in order to become his disciple, he slept on the banks of the Ganges so that Ramanandacharya could come and step on him. So Ramanandacharya stepped on him and he said, Ram, Ram. And Kabir Das said that, now Guruji, you have given me my mantra. Ramanandacharya's life, I am told, has actually been preserved by Muslims. You know, a lot of Muslims respected him and his life was preserved. And Kabir Das, of course, forget about whether you can find whether he's a Muslim or a Hindu. You can't even find out whether he was Vedantic or whether he believed in a personal God. You see, some of his writings would suggest that he believes in a personal God and some other writings would suggest that he is truly Vedantic. So this is what I mean by giving you just one example that there have been saints everywhere. In fact, I will tell you another story. I hope I will not bore you to death and then you will ask me to stop speaking. <laughs> you know, once when Vivekananda was traveling with nothing in his hand, he had decided that he will not eat anything until and unless anyone serves him with food. And somewhere near Almoda, he was unconscious. And a Muslim fakir came and gave some water on his face, gave him some fruits, and revived him. 
Then Vivekananda went to Chicago, became famous, came back to Almoda. Almoda is a very important place. There is a Ramakrishna mission there. Sister Nivedita used to live there. When he delivered his first lecture in Almoda, lots of people came to see him. This was, you know, from Colombo to Almoda. Professor Anand Kumar is talking about this book. And when these many people came to see him, he searched out that Muslim fakir who had saved his life, brought him out to the center stage and said that if this man had not been there, you would not have seen Vivekananda. So when, <laughs> when Vivekananda makes these utterances, he is not just making a political point to win votes. He is actually trying to transform the nation through his experience, which is a very deep and grounded experience. You know, when I go to a village, you know, I take my bottled water, I have a lot of comfort. Vivekananda didn't do any of that. So he actually precisely knew who is a Dalit. He actually precisely knew the nature of oppression and exploitation. And therefore, he called the poor Daridra Narayan before Gandhiji said Harijan. He is probably the first Indian who has used the term socialism. But not because he was trying to become a professor in a Western university, but because it came out of his spiritual and social learnings. The second passage that I want to read to you is the fact that all these old religions are living today proves that they must have kept that mission intact in spite of all their mistakes, in spite of all difficulties, in spite of all quarrels, in spite of all the incrustations of forms and figures. The heart of every one of them is sound. It is a throbbing, beating, living heart. They have not lost any of any one of them, the great mission they came for. So in this passage, <laughs> he is, you know, things will become even more intense. Right now, he is just saying that just like we can see a dead man from a living person, you know, tomorrow if I was not living, right, then you would say, you know, this man is dead. But today I am standing in front of you and speaking, therefore you think I am living, right? That means that heart has to beat and throb. Vivekananda is saying that in every religion that you see today, despite all their problems, Islam may have a different set of problems, Hinduism may have a different set of problems, but there is a throbbing living heart. Now let us belabor this point a little bit this throbbing living heart. <laughs> now he will say, may he who is the Brahman of the Hindus, the Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Jehovah of the Jews, the Father in heaven of the Christians, give strength to you. The Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian, but each must assimilate the spirit of others and yet preserve his individuality and grow according to his own law of growth. The parliament of religions, this is in Chicago, 1893. At that time, there is no study of comparative religion. Christians think that only Jesus Christ is good. Uh, Vaishnavas only believe in Vishnu, Shaivites believe in Shiva. <laughs> the Vedantists think that the Bhaktas are idiots. The parliament of religions, he says, has proved that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world, and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. Upon the banner of every religion will soon be written in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not destruction. So if Vivekananda had to give a fatwa, <laughs> this would be his fatwa. Embrace, learn. Hindus don't have to become Muslims. Muslims don't have to become Hindus. Buddhists don't have to become. Sister Nivedita, his closest disciple, she did not become a Hindu. She was given a proper Christian burial. 
but of course she was her disciple and then he goes on to say therefore i am firmly persuaded that without the help of practical islam theories of vedantism however fine and wonderful they may be and entirely and are entirely valueless to the vast mass of mankind we want to lead mankind to the place where there is neither the vedas nor the bible and the quran mankind ought to be taught that religions are but varied expressions of the religion which is oneness so that each may choose that path that suits him best for our own motherland a junction between the two great systems hinduism and islam vedant brain and islam body is the only hope that some of the ideas explicated in vedanta are very important because if you are truly a realized vedantic soul you cannot practice caste system right because you will see god in you will actually go and wash the toilet of a dalit rather than ask the dalit to wash your toilet but what has happened you have that vedantic brain but what is your body your body has oppressed castes and where has islam succeeded by spreading the message of brotherhood so not only do not fight <laughs> try to learn from each other and then you will get somewhere then he says invoking sri ramakrishna my master used to say that these names as hindu christian etc stand as great bars to all brotherly feelings between man and man we must break them down first they have lost all their good powers and now stand only as baneful influences under whose black magic even the best of us behave like demons i am a hindu muslims invaded us let us take the revenge i am a muslim hindus killed so many of us let us take the revenge now you've seen what we did to religion right <laughs> the saints will give their life for every religion but once greedy people like us socialize religion then we want to take revenge and then we say that you know vivekananda is great but prophet muhammad is bad prophet muhammad is great vivekananda is bad sinhala buddhists are killing sri lankan tamils myanmar buddhists are killing rohingya refugees so where are those people why did they suffer so much for us why did they do so much tapasya just so that like idiots we take our swords and keep fighting and this is sri ramakrishna saying this which only swami vivekananda has articulated so you can understand that these masters had a pretty good understanding of how idiotic we were going to be and pointed out to us very clearly <laughs> that understand your idiocy then at one point now we want to look at what he thinks about what religion should do unto each other i believe that they religions are not contradictory they are supplementary each religion as it were takes up one part of the great universal truth and spends its whole force in embodying and typifying that part of the great truth it is therefore addition and not exclusion that is the idea system after system arises each one embodying a great idea and ideals must be added to ideals and there is the march of humanity so if you want to follow vivekananda firstly you have to understand that every religion has a heart that is beating then you have to understand that if somebody is more healthy in some ways 
then you can do some exercise and learn from that religion. And every religion can do some exercise to learn from the other religion. In this way, finally, he makes the boldest proclamation. Our watchword then, says Vivekanand, will be acceptance and not exclusion. Not only toleration, for the so-called toleration is often blasphemy. And I do not believe in it. I believe in acceptance. Why should I tolerate? Toleration means that I think that you are wrong and I'm just allowing you to live. Is it not a blasphemy to think that you and I are allowing others to live? I accept all religions that were in the past and worship with them all. I worship God with every one of them in whatever form they worship him. I shall go to the mosque of the Mohammedan. I shall enter the Buddhistic temple where I shall take refuge in the Buddha and in his law. I shall go into the forest and sit down in meditation with the Hindu who is trying to see the light which enlightens the heart in everyone. Not only should I do all this, but I shall keep my heart open for all that may come in the future. Is God's book finished? Or is it a continuous revelation going on? It is a marvelous book. These spiritual revel revelations of the world, the Bible, the Vedas, the Quran, and all the other sacred books, but there are many more pages to be written. One can go on and on and on. But the point I'm trying to make is that <laughs> there is a good reason why I think that you should place it before your consideration that central to the idea of India are two things. It is a deeply religious country, it is a deeply spiritual country, and it is a country that has learned to live in harmony, unlike many of the European nation states over millennia. So this is one fact which I think is very, very central to Vivekananda. And this is the fact that I will highlight and about Gandhi, I need to say much less because I'm sure you know what Gandhiji was about. The second fact that I, which is revolutionary, I think in Vivekananda, inspired by his master Sri Ramakrishna, is work is worship. And I think here Vivekananda really departs to some extent from Shankaracharya. The reason for that is that when you go into Advaita Vedanta, you have to perceive the world as an illusion. You know, everything is an attachment. You know, I am trying to help the poor people because they will get better. Even that is considered to be an attachment. So, Advaita Vedantins say that, you know, you just have to completely, you know, disentangle yourself from everything not just your, you know, wives and children, but any kind of work that can, uh, that can lure you. But Vivekananda says no. Vivekananda says, and I think he is closer to the Buddha over here, is that work can be worship. How can work be worship? Work can be worship if you do the work without expecting any results. <laughs> now, all my friends sitting here would say, what kind of bullshit is this? We are working hard, we should get good results. He says, no. Detached work does not mean that you are not intensely interested in doing the work. But that intensity of interest is actually nothing to do with what will happen at the end. So, you know, people say, I worked very hard and then I got a bad mark in the exam. Well, try to find out why you got the bad mark and if you really, I mean, this comes straight from the Gita, right? Uh, but this is emphasized in Vivekananda, that detached work, you know, the Karma Yoga part of the Gita is deeply emphasized. And he says that this kind of work can be as uplifting as any other sadhana that you can do. And it can be equal to worship. 
The other thing is that out of this concern for humanity, after having traversed the length and breadth of India, he calls the most oppressed castes as Daridra Narayan. This is something that Gandhiji must have noticed. He says, forget about untouchability. Forget about don't touchism. You must serve them like God. And if you serve them, they will not benefit. You will benefit. Your soul will benefit. Not those people who have been oppressed. In fact, there is a story in the United States when soon after his Chicago address, uh, Rockefeller came to meet him. And he thought that, you know, Vivekanand will give him a lot of importance because, you know, he was a rich man. He could produce a lot of money. So, when Rockefeller walked into his room, he did not even raise his head. And then looking at his table in a very different direction from where Rockefeller was sitting, he just mildly uttered these words. He said, this wealth that you possess, if you give it for helping poor people, you will not be helping poor people, you will be helping yourself. And in some senses, you know, Rockefeller was completely flabbergasted. You know, what kind of a person? I am such a big person. This is, just get lost. If you have any patience for what I am saying. And, and it seems it did make an impact on him at some point in time. So when the Ramakrishna Mutt and the Ramakrishna Mission was set up, again there was this debate. That if the monks go to work, you know, how can they be realized? But he emphasized this ideal of non-detached work. In fact, one of the ideals of the Ramakrishna mission is that we don't do work to save poor people. You know, many of you may know that in Narayanpur, uh, there is a Ramakrishna mission that has worked with tribal people and produced excellent results in a Maoist area where even the police could not enter, right? It was the work of one great monk of the Ramakrishna mission, Swami Atmananda. But Swami Atmananda will not be doing this work thinking that, you know, he's doing so much for the poor people. <laughs> Swami Atmananda believes that if he has to worship Sri Ramakrishna, this is how this work has to be done. I'll give you another example. Swami Vivekananda sent two of his very closest devotees, uh, disciples, to Haridwar. And he said, you go and just try to cure people, you know, give them some medical treatment. So, you know, these two monks, they used to go and clean up the place and provide people with some medical things. And in those days, all the monks of Haridwar used to say, you know, these, are, these people are not monks. They're doing this dirty work. So one day there was a meeting of the monks and these two were not invited. Then the head of the Giri Samprada, he said, where are those two monks who clean up? This is no, no, they don't, they are not monks. They just clean up. He says, no, no, you please invite them. They are better monks than you. These two monks set up the Ramakrishna Mission's famous hospital in Kankhal. So, you know, when this blast took place in Amarnath, which was the most important hospital that served people? It was this hospital of the Ramakrishna Mission. Of course, Ramakrishna Mission will not publicized like Baba Ramdev or Sri Sri Ravi Shankar or whoever, whoever else, because they, you know, they actually cannot. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if they get polluted, they probably will, but so far, they, you will not even come to know what work they are doing. Because they have to do that work to uplift themselves. That is good enough. So, you know, it is now that I think I will not say a lot about Gandhiji because about Gandhiji, I am sure many of you know more than what I do. But for Gandhiji, work was worship. I mean, Gandhiji stands tall as a nationalist leader who said that I am a Sanatani Hindu. He didn't say, you know, I am this super, you know, highly elevated Hindu who 
uh, is a kind of agnostic, but also spiritual, but also feminist. He said, no, I am a Sanatani Hindu. And even if you don't like, there are many things I will say. But that Sanatani Hindu will go and wash the toilet of a Dalit. This is also something that Sri Ramakrishna did. You know, they, we don't hear these stories. And then we think that the whole doctrine is useless, bunkum. You know, these Hindus, these Brahmins, they're all oppressive people. Of course, they have been oppressive. And this Sanatani Hindu could make Muslims feel more secure than any of the other modern leaders. Gandhiji would go and fast and the riots will stop in Nawakali. Gandhiji said, partition will happen over my dead body. And somebody literally had to kill him for the partition to happen. So we must understand which is the idea of India that we want. Do we want that idea of India that killed Mohandas Gandhi? Or do we want that idea of India that Mohandas Gandhi died for, that Vivekanand died for. And these people, for these people, work was worship. Now, I think I have already exceeded, exceeded my time. And I'm sure because you live in India, you have a much better understanding of what is happening in India today. I will now request you to think about this idea of India, which I certainly think is Hindu. It can be Muslim and Christian and Jewish as well. And that idea of India, where everybody needs to become a Hindu of a certain type, which I cannot understand. Certainly not the kind of Hindu that Sri Ramakrishna wanted or Swami Vivekananda wanted. It is an India where, of course, Swami Vivekananda and Mohandas Gandhi both believe that creating wealth is a good thing. But both of them stressed that this wealth does not belong to you. God has given this wealth in trust to you and he is or she is watching all the time what you are doing with this wealth in your pocket. But in an India where you see a Gautam Adani rise from 4 billion to 100 billion and become the richest man in between 2004 and 2010. And because I study political economy, I can bore you with another two hours of lecture about what corruption was and what corruption is. But we don't want to get into those debates. What I'm trying to say is that 75 years after we became independent, Are we trying to do exactly what our colonizers wanted? When the British wanted partition, Gandhiji gave his life. When the British wanted to divide us on the basis of caste, he went on a fast and Dr. Ambedkar respected him. There was so much respect in Gandhi for Dr. Ambedkar that he requested Jawaharlal Nehru to invite him as the chairperson of the drafting committee of the Indian constitution. And that is why you have such a great constitution. This was the India that we were born with. Gandhiji and Tagore had many differences, but they loved each other. Netaji said, you know, I'm going to, enemy is enemy is my friend and I'm going to use force. Gandhiji said, no, I, this is, but they didn't fight with each other. Our society, our culture, our nation had such a capacity to live with diversity, to respect diversity, and to renounce one's worldly creature comforts. I mean, you are the young generation sitting in front of me, and I'm sure by the by five o'clock in the evening, many of you may have left. But this is very, very important. You know, we became independent in 1947. But in 1897, Vivekanand had written 
I do not worry about India's independence. India will become independent 50 years from now. But I am more worried about what will happen after India becomes independent. And then he went on to say, India will rise with chaos and strife, glorious and more invincible than ever before. That means that the fight is not over. And in this fight, we have to decide whether we are with Vivekananda and Gandhi or whether we are with the colonists and some of those who seem to be following their legacy. Thank you very much for your patience.